have any questions, you can uh, you can put them in there. You feel free to ask your questions at any point. Um, and as the moderator, I will uh, I will be uh, getting those questions and uh, either asking them as they fit in or providing an opportunity at the end to to ask those questions. Jeff, it's Rory here. We probably should have clarified this earlier. People are going to ask comments in the Zoom chat, right? That's your ex expectation? That is correct. And you want me to pass them on to you um, by the, uh, the Google Docs chat? Yes, please. Okay. I will collate and keep up with that. Okay, just, thanks, Rory. Just, just want to make sure on that, okay? Yep. So just to follow up again, uh, it's seven o'clock according to uh, to my computer, but I know we're expecting another dozen or two people uh, on the call. So we'll give them a few more minutes. Uh, my name is Jeff Teutsch, um, play several roles within the orienteering community and I'm gonna be moderating our chat uh, tonight. We've got several prominent members of the orienteering community um, and, uh, <clears throat> and some folks that have been doing some work on uh, on this topic of girls and women in orienteering um, joining us on the panel. We expect the conversation to last a little bit over an hour. Um, and uh, if you have any questions at any point, um, you can please put them in the text chat um, in Zoom. And uh, my colleague Rory Harding will be monitoring that and uh, passing those questions along and we'll be pro either providing you an opportunity to ask your question yourself or if it fits into the conversation um, directly, we will uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to answer that as we go. Uh, and there'll also be a, a brief opportunity at the end for uh, kind of open-ended questions. Um, if anyone has any last questions uh, at the end of the conversation. picture here. All right, so I see we have uh, representation from uh, orienteers all across the country. So that is fantastic. Uh, I know we're still expecting a few more to join. Um, so I'll, uh, over the next few minutes, I'll be continuing to provide some, some basic housekeeping. Um, if you can all keep your uh, microphones off and maybe your video uh, off, unless you're uh, asked to, uh, to speak up with, with any questions that you have, uh, that would be helpful so that we can focus on our panelists. <clears throat> um, so, we're going to get uh, get started with some introductions, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into the meat of our conversation here. Um, so, myself, um, Jeff Teutsch, um, based in Ottawa, I play several roles within the orienteering community, including as uh, the high performance director for Orienteering Canada. Um, and uh, so, through that role, I know our national team athletes, uh, Emma Sherwood and Emma Waddington, who are on our panel, um, and then uh, in my role. Um, as Orienteering Ottawa's club director. Um, I've worked uh, with Sherry Revels and also uh, Dulmi Hill, our other two, uh, two panelists. <clears throat> so we're actually, we're very lucky 
um, today to be having this conversation with two of our current national team athletes, uh, Emma Sherwood and Emma Waddington, who not only have been uh, on the Team Canada program for many, many years now, um, but have recently been doing uh, some work with Orienteering Canada um, on, uh, on sort of some equity, diversion, inclusion, um, and some, uh, some women and girls uh, stuff. Uh, they are both on the board of directors for, for Orienteering Canada, so really know, uh, know the national scene very, very well. Um, Emma Sherwood uh, is originally from Calgary, um, is now a master's student at McMaster University in Hamilton. And uh, Emma Waddington <clears throat> is originally from Hamilton, um, has uh, her undergrad degree in kinesiology uh, from McMaster, and uh, will be starting in the fall her uh, her master's degree there as well. She is currently in the Yukon to coach uh, some of their programs this summer. Uh, <clears throat> and also with us, we have Sherry Revels, um, ex-national team athlete, um, grew up in New Brunswick uh, when they had a very strong junior program, um, is now based in Ottawa, has been a member and volunteer with Orienteering Ottawa for 20 years. She has been coaching. Um, she was actually my very first Orienteering coach um, back when would that have been? That would have been about 15 years ago or so. Um, and she is the parent of three children. The youngest is a girl of age nine. Uh, so brings both the parent, coach and uh, national team athlete perspective uh, to this conversation. And finally, we have uh, Delmi Hill um, with us, who is not actually an orienteer, but is um, has been involved in this project, helping Orienteering Ottawa as a <clears throat> intern from Algonquin College in the sport business management program there. Um, she graduate, graduated from the University of Ottawa with a bachelor's in human kinetics in 2020 um, and uh, has extensive experience uh, in lacrosse and badminton as an athlete, um, both at uh, the high school and the university level, uh, and has been coaching girls uh, field lacrosse um, for Nemesis Lacrosse uh, as well. So she brings that extra, um, extra perspective to our conversation, as well as the work she has been doing for Orienteering Ottawa. So those are the four panelists uh, that we have with us. Um, we're going to be talking for about an hour and then there'll be a chance to have some, uh, some open questions at the end. Uh, there's kind of three main topics that we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna be speaking about in no particular order, kind of the social aspect um, of orienteering and, and uh, how girls in particular socialize and what that means for uh, the way we design programs. Um, then we'll be talking a little bit more about programs in depth and the coaching aspect of that. Uh, and finally, we'll touch a little bit on uh, the promotion and how to um, promote our programs uh, to attract and retain girls within uh, programs and, and orienteering in general. Um, so welcome, Emma, Emma, Sherry, and Dalmi, and welcome uh, everyone to the conversation. Um, I'm going to start off um, with a little bit um, of, of a further intro about your own experiences, all four of you, with orienteering and sport in general um, in terms of your, your experience uh, with the sport and, and specifically what you noticed with how it was taught to you as a girl in, in that sport. Because this issue of girls in sport is not an orienteering specific issue. It's across the board within sport in Canada and probably around the world. Um, and uh, so let's let's start off with that. Um, and uh, and then we'll take the conversation from there. So whoever wants to wants to start can can jump in. I can start us off here. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Emma, part one of this conversation. <laughs> um, so for me, I um, my story kind of starts with um, learning how to orienteer really um, when I was living in Sweden when I was about eight years old. Um, here, 
Um, it was really, really fun for me because the community is obviously much, much larger, much more extensive for kids um, over there as opposed to here in, in Canada back um, around 2006. Um, and then I came back to Canada after living in Sweden and I just didn't really enjoy orienteering because I was the only girl, the only kid um, around at that point. So for me, it, it wasn't super fun. And I think that's kind of how my story in this starts because um, in 2010, when Don't Get Lost uh, started their Adventure Running Kids program, our first pilot night had me and like three or four of my really, really good friends from school in it. Um, not because I peer pressured them into coming with me or anything. But um, at that point, I kind of realized like, hey, like this can be really fun because I was in this kind of um, empowered group having having more fun not really remembering much about the training itself but you know having having funny memories about my friends falling down hills and into the mud and and fun things like that and I think that starting in a, a, a developmental path um, in sport with with good memories kind of allows everything to build and fall into place um, after that, it um, that made me kind of continue with the program, get more into um, cross country, um, especially in university, um, and then of course join join the national team. Um, so I'll kind of be speaking to to my story in that I was kind of in the program at a younger age with lots of girls, getting further into our adventure running kids program with mostly boys, kind of in that early high school, late middle school. Um, and then being on the national team now, um, I'm actually the only woman on the senior national um, program group of, of the Team Canada program at the moment. So um, that's kind of the, the aspect that I'll be, be speaking to um, today. So I think a lot of the other panelists have very different experiences. So I'll let them give their story now. Thanks, Emma. I can go ahead. Um, I grew up orienteering in New Brunswick. We started as a family. I have four brothers, um, so very much used to being with boys. Um, uh, our phys ed teacher got us into orienteering in a small town in New Brunswick, and there was a, a great group of 20 uh, juniors age, you know, 10 to 16. Um, not many families, but the families had a lot of kids there. <laughs> Um, I had a great experience as a junior in New Brunswick. Uh, we had, I, and I think the social part was a lot of it after the events, the Sunday morning events that, you know, weren't that big. Uh, there was always a core group of us that um, socialized. Uh, there was never as many girls. It didn't bother me. I didn't really think too much of it, to be honest. Except I didn't have any competition, but I always aimed to compete against the boys. So it was still competitive for me because I just tried to, to, to beat the boys. Um, as I got into my teens, um, Pam James on the call became my role model and travel partner and coach from time to time. Um, so she was definitely a big influence as I was on the you know, in my teens and on the national team. Um, yeah, that's my, my background. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, I can go. Um, I've had some similar and different experiences to both of them. Um, I started when I was 11. Um, someone suggested to my mom that uh, her kids might like orienteering. And so I joined, I actually joined later than almost all of the other kids in the Calgary junior program. At that point, there was already a core group of girls who were there when I joined, um, which I think was really nice. Um, and as I guess I got older, um, there were fewer and fewer of them, uh, and more, I was training more with some, a group of, uh, boys who were a couple of years younger than me. Um, I think that one of the sort of like foundational or like one of the, some of the experiences that really got me interested in staying with orienteering were actually some trips 
I took with mostly those girls, but sometimes not sometimes just with different people. Um, but like, for example, going to Sage Dump, which is maybe a four hour drive away from Calgary with that group of girls. I remember as having been like one of the experiences that was really fun and made me want to keep with it. Um, and eventually, yeah, I joined the junior national team and made my way up to the, uh, as I got older, I specifically remember choosing to go to uh, a university where they had an orienteering club. Um, and yeah, I don't know if there's anything else I should add to that, but that's kind of how I joined. Cool. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'll, I'll maybe come back to this in a, in a minute, but um, I think it would be really interesting to hear what what got you into um, the work that you're currently doing with the um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and how how um, your story ties in ties in with that? But first, Domi, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background, particularly with uh, with lacrosse? So um, like Jeff mentioned, I uh, played uh, lacrosse in high school and um, throughout my university career. Um, I had a friend who was helping coach the girls, pro uh, girls lacrosse team in high school and he uh, kind of annoyed me into joining it and I enjoyed it so I stuck with it. Um, and it's different for me because lacrosse, like feel lacrosse, it's like the men's and women's game are so very different from each other that we don't really even practice with boys or like our rules are different. So I've always only um, play, um, played on a team with girls and a huge part of playing a team sport is being like social with, with each other because we need to like know who the person is in, behind you, in front of you. So on the field, so if you're running a play, you're like, okay, I know who's here um, and the ball needs to go to that person and I need to get their attention. So it's, it's like a social, like a team sports always have a huge social component to it. Um, and it's easier when you're part of a team to be social as well, because you practice together. You are like, uh, you travel together as a team as well where um, I feel like orienteering has a little bit of um, a diff more difficult time with that social aspect just because it, it's a little individual. Yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting, uh, Dalmi. I, I think that's one of the things that, you know, for both boys and, and girls is a, is a big factor, right? It is an individual sport. We do go out and, and do the sport on our own in the woods. But that doesn't necessarily stop us from treating a group as a as a team, right? And one of the one of the things that the Team Canada program has been doing over the last year is really trying to ingrain that concept of team into into the program. And um, we've been seeing a bit of a shift in culture in that respect. It's still an individual sport, absolutely, but you know okay, let's support each other, let's work together, let's train together and do all of that stuff as if we were, well, we are on the same, the same team, right? And uh, so I think that's certainly one of the challenges that we need to learn to overcome. And I think we can develop our programs in such a way that, that puts that aspect in there. We just need to figure out, okay, how do we do that across the board and do that in, uh, in a way that works well, right? I think um, a good example of this um, from my personal story, so, um, the first year that I said the Junior World Champs, um, I was also asked to race at the Senior World Champs because of a lack of women um, to fill positions at the, the Senior World. So here's little little tiny Emma, <laughs> only 16 years old, going straight from her first Junior World to her first Senior World. And I remember at, at Jaywalk, we were in Norway, and I had a great group of friends. Um, we were like, honestly, I remember more of the dumb pranks that we, that we pulled on the U S team, um, at that race more than I remember the actual races themselves. And I remember just being fully immersed in this really supportive team community because we we're all friends. We we're all having good times. 
Um, and then going directly to the senior world champs, I remember just like having a terrible time because everybody was like serious. They were professionals there. And I was just like, I am so much shorter than everybody. And I think that just speaks a lot of volume to the fact that the team community, regardless that we're a very individual sport, where your teammates are the people that you're going to learn the most from um, because they all have their own experiences and what they're bringing into the team. So um, I definitely think that the social component, no matter if you're just you're there to race and you're there to show them what you can do, you're not going to get very far as, unless you have this a supportive social community on your team. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, that's awesome. Thanks for that, uh, that extra story. And I think that really exemplifies what some of what we're talking about. <clears throat> so you're talking a little bit about the social, the social aspect of, of, of that team and some of the extra activities that you were doing there. And I'm going to ask this as an open-ended question for, for all of you. Um, what are some of the social components that are really important to building that kind of community, that kind of team? Um, and are there, is there anything that stands out in your mind based on your own experience, both as athletes and as coaches, um, that are different for boys and girls in, in that respect of building that, that team um, and that support and those friendships? Um, okay, I have, I have two kind of sort of concepts to this that'll get to your first to answer the first part of the question. I remember as a kid, I really liked, um, like hanging out after races, um, or like traveling together, like carpooling, which we obviously can't do right now, but that was like a really good time to get to know people and playing games. But, you know, when I'm like 11, 12, 13, playing games in the car, um, if we went to like a training camp or a race weekend, we get to play cards in the evening, that sort of stuff where I think were some good bonding moments, um, for me, um, as to the, the girls and boys difference thing, um, I have a couple thoughts about this. One is that I think like we have to be careful about generalizations because of course, like not every girl is like one thing and not every boy is like a different thing, but, um, I think what might be sort of more, not necessarily more important, but uh, nice is being not sort of the only person of what, who is like you in a room. Like, um, I think I remember at my first jaywalk, so I was 16, um, and I remember being really, really grateful that Pia was there because it was just me, Pia, and six boys. Um, so... It was like, even though, like, obviously we were hanging out with the boys and they were great and we were all friends and it, it was super, super fun, but I was really glad that Pia was there um, as another woman on the team, if that sort of helps answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think as a child up until maybe age, I'm guessing, 12, 13, I have fond memories of, you know, uh, climbing trees, uh, running in streams after events, getting into some, you know, just trouble going places where we shouldn't as a bunch of kids. And I don't think it mattered whether it was boys or girls at that age. Mind you, I was always used to playing with boys because I grew up with boys. Then as, you know, maybe 14 plus, I think I liked, you know, chatting with the girls after races. Yeah. And um, like to add to Emma Sherwood's point, um, it's about finding someone you fit with, I, for sure. Because uh, like Sheree, I, I grew up with brothers um, and uh, what, when I was in elementary school, I went to an all girls Catholic school. So I went from hanging out with my brothers all the time to like a very strict girls only like environment. It was, it was kind of difficult for me, to be honest, because 
I was used to running around and <laughs> like Sharice said, getting into trouble. Um, and it's um, even still to this day, sometimes I have an easier time uh, bonding with a, like a, a, a new, um, like talking to a, a, a guy than maybe necessarily a girl. Um, I, it's, I feel like it's more of finding something somewhere that you feel like you can fit is essentially what kids are looking for as well. I mean, that's all what we're all looking for. But as an adult, you like you have better ways of coping with like uh, like changing your opinion or just having like so something else to be interested in just to like fit in sort of thing. But as a kid, like you, you don't really that concept doesn't really like get into you right so yeah it's just about finding somewhere that you fit yeah yeah absolutely I, th I find it really interesting that that both you and, and Emma kind of highlight the point that it doesn't necessarily need to be the same gender right it's about fitting into the group and I think the the gender aspect helps in that regard um, but isn't necessarily um, all Im important. Um, the other thing, of course, that, that stands out is none of you really mentioned anything about actual being in the woods, practicing the sport, right? It's about the before, it's about the after, it's about the trips, it's about, you know, the playing games, the chatting and, and all of that, right? And, and uh, um yeah, and and I find that uh, I find that that really interesting. So I have a question um, that that kind of fits in to to what we're talking about now. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask this on on Rory Harding's behalf, um, which is what has been your experience and what have you heard from from others um, about feeling how welcomed you feel at orienteering events at at uh, at local races that kind of thing um are we providing a welcoming enough experience to i guess from a social from a social perspective um to our events for newcomers for for women and girls in particular Delmi, were you saying something there? I think you're on mute. Oh, no, sorry. I was just thinking, like, I can't really speak on personal experience because I haven't really had a chance to go to an event, so. No, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about um, what some of the sports that you have participated in, what they do to welcome newcomers to, to the sport, to a team, whatever it may be. Um, I guess my experience will be when I like joined the lacrosse team in high school, it was um, made up of girls that like were in the same classes as I was because a lot of the um, girls were in the same grade as I was. So I didn't really have, like I already knew the people. So it was easier for me to fit in. But when I joined my lacrosse team, um, I'd already been in, um, I think I joined in second year. I didn't know it existed in the first year. So when I got there, all these girls had already been like together for a year. They all knew each other. And um, I had another one girl who I knew from the program. So I kind of stuck to her a little bit, but um, we were supposed to, so we practiced a few times and then um, on a weekend, we were supposed to go to Toronto to play a U of T and uh, York U. And the night before we left, we kind of got together at the captain's house and we played like a few card games and like things like that. So, and um, they were pretty welcoming that way where they were like, okay, well, like how long, like, what are you in? And um, like, how long have you played lacrosse for? And, like, how do you like Ottawa and things like that? So it's, it's kind of difficult. I don't know. Uh, we we are a team, and like it's like knowing the person you're playing like on the same line like, kind of matters. Um, I feel so. It's it's a, a bit of a different environment, I think. 
Yeah, um, one of the things one of the things that that I heard in your your response there, Delmi, is something that is kind of endemic to to sport um, as a as an issue that that is recognized and is and and people are working on addressing it. It's hard to join a lot of sports after most of your peer group joins it, right? If you haven't joined the sport by nine years old or 10 years old or whatever it may be, it's really hard to join because that group has already gelled, right? And so how do we consciously make an effort to be open to having new athletes join that group at a later stage? Because it's a real problem if, okay, you're 12 years old, well, you can't really join a sport anymore. It's too late. You've missed that window, right? That's not that's not what we're aiming for, right? That's not what anybody is aiming for. And yet it's natural. It's nobody's fault that these groups have formed, but it's something that we need to recognize and we need to we need to address, right? Um, to answer Rory's question from my point of view, I've always found orienteering people welcoming and have no reason to believe girls don't feel welcome. Um, the only thing I could say is um, for perhaps more competitive events, um, you know, as I got older and competitive, um, you know, the exciting, the results are often about the men's results um, and the girls are, you know, the, well, they're the, the girls category, the, the big exciting ones are, are, are the M21. And, um, but that's also perhaps because the girls category often doesn't have much competition. So it's not always as exciting. But, um, but other than that, I've always felt welcomed. Yeah. yeah. Um, to add to your point, Cherie, I, I think that's just a general societal issue. To be honest, um, there is always going to be more excitement around men's sports, um, but it's slowly changing, which is a good thing for sport in women in general. But um, it's for sure something to work on, not just in orienteering, but like in all every sport. Um, I have another kind of general um, point to the the welcoming thing, and I think. It kind of goes along with the kind of making sure that um, a new member or somebody who's kind of like they're engaged but they're not not quite sure is um, kind of the the expectations that you put on them and how you uphold them. So I kind of I remember when I was younger, um, a, friends and I would always do um, a team race with Don't Get Lost, and we would pretty much win every year and then this one year I got super lost and like the end I remember someone being like Emma like what the heck like what happened like why did you do that why didn't you win today like what's happening do the boys beat you oh the boys beat you again that means you're not you know doing as well today because that and that that language kind of hurt and I know that it mean that didn't they didn't mean it that way but being if saying things like oh you won't the boys beat you again like that it's, it's kind of we all think is is clear but it's saying things like that definitely don't don't bode well into the to welcoming commit uh, community um so i think if somebody's kind of you know having a, a bad day um they don't have to be degrading on on the bad day that they have it's just kind of a Oh, like I, I've had that before too. Like, let's work together um, and have a good discussion. Have that social component afterwards to kind of um, keep them engaged and not further other them from from a new group. Um, and I think there's definitely um, you had a question from Nevin about orienteering compared to other sports. Um, so I did a lot of track and field um, in cross country all through high school and university, and I think that. Um, orienteering for sure is is way more welcoming um than than track or cross country like there i remember this this um instagram account for high school cross country posted this girl had won 
off the cross country in this super fast time, despite the fact that it was snow and ice and she was that was phenomenal race and this old man was like, Wow, that's slow. Like like okay, I'd like to see you try. <laughs> like, what the heck? Um, and I, I feel like there's a lot of these kind of things about like in orienteering, we're not you're not concerned about how fast you go. Um, what's your personal best? It's it's you know, like how are you improving and how are you developing in the sport? Like what um have you been able to accomplish since the season started or um through a weekend of racing? So I think um just from a welcoming perspective, orienteering has been a way better community than than a lot of other sports. Um but uh yeah. That's awesome. Um, let's, uh, let's move on here. We're, uh, we're at a little past 7.30 now. Um, and we've got a couple of other topics that we wanted to, uh, to try to cover in our conversation as well. So I know, you, I think you've all coached in, in various degrees, um, either with orienteering or, or other sports. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if, starting with with Sherry um you can tell us a little bit about your experience um with coaching um and what yeah what your experience has been coaching orienteering with respect to boys uh, and girls what approach you've taken if any to um trying to well to coaching to coaching them differently at all uh, I think what I've noticed with the kids and with my own kids is that uh, boys tend to, they want to be good at something. They want to do something and feel like they're good at it. They have to be good at it. And girls, I don't think that matters as much. Um, and I don't think, I've noticed when they're out, when I've been out with the girls group, hardly any of them are competitive. Like everything with the boys, you, you want to race and I tend to want to make things into a race but the girls they just want to go in there with their friend um, so I've certainly noticed that uh, can't think of anything right now right offhand to add to that no that's that's great Sherry and and obviously we're talking in, in generalities here but I know that that is something that is is known. And I guess one more thing to add, and this, again, is personal experience. I think girls tend to be a little more insecure. So boys think they're good at it. They don't need instruction. Girls are insecure. They want instruction. Um, so you kind of, you know, direct it differently when you're coaching. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, fantastic. Yeah, I think going off, off of that point, I think... Um, at different phases of development for, for girls and boys, I think that coaching should be addressed differently. Um, so girls, I, I like to think of like phases um, as opposed to ages because everybody develops very differently. Um, I think kind of at that, there's like this vulnerable stage for girls around like the puberty age. So kind of like grade five to grade eight or so um, where like self-esteem and self-confidence really starts to plummet um, and this is the age that girls drop out of sport about two times more um, than boys do um, and I think at this stage is, is kind of that girls need a little more time to kind of get into the group dynamic um, they develop they, they need a little more um, time to get confident in with the group of people that they're they're situated with um you think of like a, a junior program all these people you might not know you kind of thrown into a group and then told to do a really hard exercise and you gotta learn how to do the exercise but also like all these people are watching and um i think playing to the strengths of of girls that they can do when they're kind of feeling that they they might not be as good as the boys who are developed a lot quicker than them already um Get playing to their strengths to build their confidence and then progressing them through a little bit of challenge or so it's like enough challenge that they can get better um, but they're still in that comfort zone is kind of at this vulnerable age to kind of slow it down um, and maybe work with girls only in this kind of environment but once you get older then I think immersing girls and boys together to kind of you know get that 
more competitive side if, if they're going into a competitive sport um kind of you know training with the boys so i'm like yeah i can do that as well um but that, at the end of the day i think like sheree said it kind of it, it changes um it changes over the phases of development so. yeah that's awesome <clears throat> so what building building on that that answer that you gave us there emma um can you kind of tell us a little bit at what stages it becomes beneficial to actually provide separate programming for girls and boys i know orienteering ottawa has has run a pilot program um to provide exactly that a girls group for our learn to train um group which is the kind of the nine to twelve year old roughly range um and um unfortunately we ran a pilot in 2019 and then haven't really had a program since um but uh but i'd be interested in hearing what you know about uh, about that a little bit more yeah so i think kind of um in kind of like the elementary school phase girls you know like they don't really care they haven't really started to learn kind of the stereotypical social constructs um about like oh girls aren't supposed to do this and boys aren't supposed to do that which is obviously very generalized and we're trying to create an environment that weighs away from that but i think you know at the youngest ages it doesn't really matter but you get into the the vulnerable kind of puberty um phase and that's when i think that um, because this low self-confidence is, is really starting to kick in, that's, that's kind of when um, things that like the organization like Fast and Female kind of focuses on girls this age to um, build up that self-confidence, um, keep them in sport um, and with the girls only environment. I, I was involved in a couple programs with Fast and Female and that day was um, it's all about embracing being a girl and, you know, pink and sparkles and, you know, rainbows and whatever but in at first I was like you know what that's that's really cheesy um but then you look at it from the perspective that's like no I can still do that but still be really really good um and really get these things done and be confident in myself that I can get them done um and I think that if you can build these positive environments where girls can can thrive without being pressured by boys who may be developing a lot faster than them than, than them at this age um, pre, like like physically developing, um, especially in their their motor skills um, um, at that age, then then they can become confident so that when they get into places like high school where they're much more integrated with with boys and in, in different sports, then they've already created this environment that has already allowed them to thrive, and they're just applying it to a new situation. So um, building a strong friend group kind of early on in my orienteering can career kind of let me know like hey I can really do this sport um but now my friends are just changed and you know what maybe I'll try and you know work out with them like I remember in ARX being the only girl a few nights and but but these are my friends and they're enjoying the same sport as I am so I'm I'm able to kind of work with them and learn um new techniques for them because they obviously are bringing a lot of knowledge to the table um as well so um and I think the last one I wanted to make about this is kind of that transition from late high school and early post-secondary education where um, it's not so much a um, decrease in like uh, self-confidence, but it's more so of kind of like an overwhelming, like, can I do all these things? It's a really, really big life change. And I think that if you're looking into coaching at this age, it's a bit more about being, um, proactive in your coaching so you kind of want to give like for, I would have liked kind of an orienteering coach to give me a lot of resources and information up front and let me do with with it what I could do because I was I wouldn't I was not able to attend a junior program because I had class at that time I was trying to figure out how a new schedule timeline worked um, I wasn't able to go to weekend races because I had cross-country training but if I had all these these resources up front I could kind of on my own time once I got the swing of things and once I was 
comfortable, kind of start integrating them more, more into um, my life at that point without having to reach out when it was too late um, because I was realizing, oh, I would really like to be doing that right now. So um, at this time, I think it would be like being really flexible with coaching um, and adjusting um, whenever anything needs adjusting and keeping it, keeping it fun um, and pressure free. So um, that was a lot of information. I'm sorry, but I hope that answered um, all those uh, points there. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's that's great. Um, so we talked a little bit about about girls specific things, and you talked Emma about um, the uh, fast and female group. Um, and so we have another question from Nevin here, um, and. I'm gonna I'm gonna direct this to both of uh, both of the Emmas and maybe Emma Sherwood you can you can start on this one. So the question is: We've seen other sports like trail running, skiing, and cycling do women specific training camps or training days. Um, is that something you'd suggest clubs in Canada should try to organize? Um, I think it might be beneficial. I mean, I don't know for sure. I don't. Like uh, another sport, I did had an event like that, and I ended up not going to it, but um, not for a particular reason. Like I just like I think some people will really be interested in that, and some people will um, not find that particularly any more or less useful. I I don't necessarily have a, but I again I've never been to something like that so i don't know what it would be like so i don't know if i'm the best person to answer that question just yet fair enough yeah i mean i i agree um i think it kind of would depend on the target audience i think that if you're um targeting like a, a trail running day for young girls ages 10 to 14 i think that would be be hugely popular um but Otherwise, it, it's a fine line between like singling out women that they, they have to have their own special day um, versus the fact that they can do the same as anybody else. Um, what's really interesting we find with Don't Get Lost, our, our team race that's done in the winter on snowshoes, teams of two rather than teams of three. Um, and this race is, I think we have about two thirds of the entire participant list are female. Um, which is really interesting and I'm wondering maybe like a team of two situation is different than a, an individual because there's more of that social aspect so I think days like women's only like um, I know the ski club um, where I'm from does a woman on skis day um, and it's hugely hugely popular um, so I think maybe if you're targeting that kind of 10 to 14 or kind of puberty age group or the kind of starting a new sport and not not really um sure about it um as adults i think that that would be very beneficial but it, it really it comes down to who the person is and what what they want to get out of it i think mm -hmm. yeah like i know where i'm at currently in orienteering like i don't think i need that but i think at different stages that might have been more beneficial but for now like i'm yeah, that, I guess that's what I want to say. Is that I agree with Emma that like at certain stages it might be more, um, yeah, more beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Not to not not to take away from the concept of a women's only training day, but we need more training days in, in general and more coaching um, in in orienteering. Right, a lot of a lot of orienteering comes down to teaching yourself how to do the sport, and I think that's something that we need to change in general and. I think based on everything I'm hearing that this is probably more true for women and, and girls than it is for boys. I, I suspect, and I don't have any data on this, but I suspect that boys and, and men are more willing to try to teach themselves something or are more likely to try to teach themselves something. Whereas women and girls are more likely to want that kind of guidance and that coaching and that support. Um, so I suspect that if we could, if we were to, work on that side of developing the sport that that would have an impact on on what we're talking about today yeah and i think that in terms of i think 
I mean, for me personally, I like to have, if I'm teaching myself something, I really like to have validation that I can, that I've, you know, checked those boxes on my list of things I need to accomplish and learn. Um, like I'm one of those people that if I'm doing math homework, like I have to check off that I got the answer right as I go. Like I can't do the whole question set and then check them all. Like I need to know, like, did I do it right? Um, and I think that, I mean, that might be just a personal issue, but I think that, that having that, that feedback instant feedback and like validation that you're doing it right like you're not doing it the best maybe as everybody else but that doesn't matter you like sure you said like you 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 don't have to be competitive you just you kind of like being out there and know that you can do it yourself um and I think that that definitely helps that that low spike of self-confidence um being able to be validated um in a positive environment so So, okay, so the next question that I have is related to that coaching, that coaching aspect. So co there's coaching overall, um, which we certainly need to improve. Um, but as much as we have a, a um, lack of balance in, in participation between boys and girls, the same is true uh, with coaches. Most of our coaches are male. Um, how important is it and what has your experience been with having male versus female coaches and i'm hoping i can get each of you to answer that um emma i know we've we've talked about this you and i so maybe you can uh, you can lead us off is that is that me sure. or not I, like <laughs> I meant emma waddington either way Uh, if she's frozen, I can, yeah. I can take a step. Yeah, why, why don't you jump in there? Uh, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so I actually started with a lot of coaches who were women, um, which was great. They, I learned a lot from them. Um, and I think that was great. And I also have had a lot of coaches who are men who have also taught me so much. Um, and I think I've had really beneficial uh, coaching from all of all of them. Um, but I think what, what was also important in addition to the coaching, um, like while it was really great to have like all these women coaching me as a young kid was also um, role models. Um, so not just the coaches as role models, but also like older athletes like um, Tori or Emily Kemp, who I could look up to and see that's like a path um, for me in the future. Like Tori was, you know, a girl from Calgary who had grown up and joined the national team. And I think like looking up to her as a role model was also really important for me. Um, but yeah, so I think coaches are important, but so are role models. Yeah, I, I have the kind of the opposite history as Emma as most of my coaches growing up were male. Um, I've only ever had one, maybe one and a half. <laughs> I don't know if you call a full-time coach but a, one real full-time female coach um and honestly I have had coach-like figures who have given me more female specific information than my female coaches have so I think um in terms of like the progression of an athlete having female specific coaches may be more important kind of um at an older age when you kind of run you start getting to these different female specific health issues um, but that doesn't mean that it's only a female's job to tell another female about, you know, nutrition and overtraining and loss of menstruation. It's like a male coaches can be educated and aware and provide resources just as well. So um, I think when in the grand scheme of things, role models progress and move with the athlete throughout their entire developmental athletic career. So when you're young, you might look up to, you know, the, your, your competitor. I remember you know, like my friend's in orienteering that I would see a few times a year I would look up to them because like I was they were really relatable to me like they're my age and they're my friend um and I wanted to do as well as them um and then your role models change kind of throughout your career depending on kind of what you want to get out of the sport I remember finding this this athlete who is from Greece and she's like very open about her 
her story and things that go well and things that don't go well. Um, and I thought she was just really cool and she's kind of, you know, grown with me as more of a um, elite level athlete throughout the years. And then of course your own teammates that you see doing well. Um, I think role models at the end of the day are, are, are very important. Um, and it doesn't have to be somebody who's incredibly accomplished. Um, like I said, it could just, you know, be your friend or your teammate. Um, and yeah, I think at the end of the day, role models are very important. Um, I had all male coaches growing up, um, you know, phys ed teacher, older men, I, um, and I had no problem you know, I thought they were fantastic. I learned, you know, how to take a rough bearing from Ted de Saint Croix and different things from Brian Graham, and it was all good. Um, when we, when I would train as a national team, and we'd go out on our own without a coach, I I believe we almost always broke up with the, like the girls go off, the few girls go together, and the few boys, and I think that I learned a lot from those sessions as well. And I probably want to learn much if I was with, you know, my competitive 20 year old boys at that teammates at that time as um, the girls. I, in my experience with the kids program, just in Ottawa, I do wonder a little bit about the boy coat, like the teenage boy coaches. I mean, in general, Teenage boys don't say much, and I, I don't know how, you know, welcoming that is for, you know, like a young, I mean, I'll say girl, but I don't know if it matters if it's a girl or boy, but, you know, they're just not very talkative, and I don't know if that's a welcoming, you know, I don't know, yeah, environment. That, that, yeah, that's interesting. My that observation. You, that you bring that up, right, that that um you know as a as a role model as a leader the role of the coach is to do so much more than just teach a specific skill right it's about leading the group it's about bringing them bring the group together it's about having that that leadership it's about being a, a role model to them and you can't be that role model you can't be that leader if you're closed off right yeah although I would say, I think you can for the boys. I think having a boy looking up to an older teenage boy is fantastic role model, even if they don't talk. Um, but I don't know about for a girl. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. There, there can be a place for that, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, with that, it, it, we've, I've had experience with my friends who are, who are teenage boys coaching the younger groups in our, our kids program um and I think that the younger girls were were fine with that because you know teenage boys are kind of when you're, you're a young girl you can kind of make fun of teenage boys even though they're, they're older than you I feel like that was it <laughs> anyways um I think it went once that age gap becomes a little bit smaller though like a a boy a teenage boy coaching a girl who's only a few years younger that's when I think that kind of awkwardness um that you like I wouldn't really want to listen to somebody a few years older than me coaching me because like unless they were my teammate and like if it was just a random person I'd be like I don't know about this but um I think it it comes down to a coach or a coach figure that that's relatable um that you can trust um All right. Domi, do you have anything to add um, um, to what the others have been saying? Uh, I've, uh, so for me, it's kind of different because um, most of my coaches have been women. Um, it's kind of difficult, for, I think, if, uh, for a, a man to coach women's field lacrosse because it's vastly different from men's field lacrosse. Um, but I like there obviously there is very much the benefit of having a woman or even like a teenage girl like coaching you because you are able to relate to them more and um, if you have like specific questions that about anything that you can ask them um, and 
in when I was coaching girls, um, they would just talk like when they're waiting in line for drills, they would just talk at you all the time. And like you have to respond because otherwise they're not like you can't develop a bond with them, right? And even if they're just like talking your ear off about homework, um, you have to respond and um, it's, it's a way to like develop that bond where they would like trust you to come with any problems they might have. Like for example, when you're away on a road trip, something like that. So, um, and like, like Sheree said, it's difficult for a teenage boy to do that if they're, they don't talk much at all. Um, like, like I said, I have brothers and when they don't talk much at all. So um, there's obviously like benefits of having a, a, a boy who's a coach, but um, I think after a certain age, um, it ha like girls want to be coached by a girl maybe. Right. So we're, uh, we're at eight o'clock now. So I want to keep this moving with the last couple of questions. Um, and then there's a couple of questions from the audience uh, that hopefully we have a chance to, uh, to address. Um, so we talked a little bit about the concept of role models. Um, and I wonder what role those role models can play and sh and showing those female athletes um, can play in terms of attracting girls to the sport through uh, through promotion, whether it be on social media or or otherwise. Um, what are the things to keep in mind when promoting specifically to girls um, in terms of aspects of the program? Um, what kind of imagery do we need to show? Um, are there a couple of things that stand out to you? Um, in your own experience, as these are the things that uh, that that we should be showing. Um, I think that I think first of all, I think that one of the the main things that organizations and clubs and everybody can do um, is to promote and make girls aware of some of the older athletes, post athletes, potential role models in the sport. Um, I think that by doing this, you are kind of pre-paving a path um, for them. You're, you're, if, if I can share my story about all the things that I've gone through, the things that did not work out, the things that did work out, and what I did learn from them, um, I can kind of show girls that like, hey, I made that mistake too. Maybe you did as well, but this is what I learned from it. Maybe you can overcome it um, in a similar way so that you can keep progressing down the path. Um, uh, towards different opportunities um, and I think that if a young girl can find somebody who's relatable within their sport then they kind of even if they don't know this person they kind of already feel a little bit more included um, and I think that what doing what you can do to promote promote role models is you know um, I came back from the junior world championships where I did really really well in 2018 and don't get lost no offense to anybody who's on the call didn't really do anything about it and I don't really care about that from my own perspective but I kind of wish that people have been made aware that I came from this little club um I grew up through the whole ARC program and I could accomplish things like this and I wish that other girls could see that story and think hey maybe I could have done that too um so I think that in promoting promoting role models we don't want to just highlight the people who do the best um, we want to highlight a whole range of abilities because orienteering is a sport where not everybody is going to go down a high performance pathway. Um, maybe you just really want to do well at the weeknight race um, and you can look towards, you know, some of your older teammates or older people in the club who, you know, have a great personality, a great approach to the sport, um, kind of make younger girls aware, aware of these people. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, promote them with these club connect calls or on social media or just the introduction on the Facebook page. I don't know. Um, there's so many different options, but um, yeah, I hope that, hope that answers the question. Yeah, it's fantastic. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, I think that the representation is really important here, being able to see yourself in the 
like whether it's just in the media or at events or whatever as a see role models um, who are like you in one way or another whether it's their women or their or something else um, and I definitely agree with Emma that like showcasing the multiple paths um, you could take as a girl in sport um, like whether it's as a high performance athlete or a coach or a mapper um, seeing people going out doing those things like whether it's Megan Rance coaching at um, CESP free camps or whatever I think is definitely like a a good way to see the multiple like not everyone has to become a high performance athlete um but i think that helps too yeah awesome so i have one last question before we move on to uh the questions from the audience um and Dolly, i want to give you the last word on this um since you've been doing some direct work on this in with about 40 seconds for for each of you can you summarize the number one suggestion you would have for um your orienteering club or or the provincial organization orienteering canada um what is the number one thing that orienteering organizations could do in canada to attract and retain uh more girls and women in the sport of orienteering um, it's kind of difficult. Um, so, um, I would say showing that, um, there is room for them would be one thing. Um, so be it in a tweet or be it in a, like a Facebook post, don't always use, um, a, a male picture, like maybe keep a track of how, how, how often, um, females are promoted it, or not promoted per se uh, are used in your promotional materials and try to keep it at a balance and maybe be aware of hey are we screwed uh, like skewed one way or another right um and just being open is like one way to do that and um if you notice hey this person was here this week but they didn't come again find out why um just don't be don't leave any stone unturned is it's a, it's a, it's a like would be one of my another another suggestions that's awesome Delmi. anybody uh anyone else on the panel have uh have any big takeaways for for organizations um, i think mine goes back to the role model um, or just general awareness of different pathways um, in all different corners of, of the sport. Um, being female specific, I think just, you know, allow for interactions um, between, I mean, I remember my dad basically like pushing me towards Emily Kemp one day and be like, talk to her. I was like, ah um but like if it could have been in kind of this situation where you know Emily was doing kind of like a mentorship or post-race analysis with different people who were there maybe I would have you know wanted to be there um with my other friends who were at the race or something um kind of facilitating opportunities because a young girl probably isn't actively gonna gonna go and seek that out um, and I think that the biggest thing in whatever it is, is, is storytelling, um, sharing your own experiences, because a lot of people go through the same, same experiences from before and um, can relate to that. And that, that just builds a stronger community. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Emma Sherwood, did you have something you were going to add to that? Um, I was going to say, I think that as... Um... As orienteering grows, I think we'll be gonna, it's going to be easier to retain girls and women um, as sometimes you need that like sort of critical mass of people to be there. Um, and I know that having that group of like six or seven girls that I had as a kid was really good. Um, I don't know if it would have been hard for a boy to join because it was all girls. But I think like as orienteering grows and junior programs grow, when we have more people, it might be easier because there's sort of a group of people who are like you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
And I think um, our Sunday morning events for both boys and girls, we need we need the kids to get to know each other. So whether it's, you know, at 1030 or you're out running at 11 o'clock, you know, a semi-organized game of tag to 1130 for the kids, like if everybody starts at different times and comes back, they don't, they need to play together and to want to go out because they have friends in orienteering and our events are really big that we have 150 people. You might not get to know the other kids. I think that would benefit the girls and the boys. Yeah, that's fantastic. Suggestions, suggestions across the board. Um, and uh, I love, I love kind of ending with that takeaway because I know we've got representation from a variety of clubs across the country here. So, so thank you all uh, for that. Um, it's 10 past eight uh, now um, in Eastern time, that is. Um, and uh, so why don't we take five minutes um, to wrap up with a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I see uh, there's a question from Tracy. Tracy, do you want to ask the question that you had put in the uh, chat there? I can. So just from a coaching perspective and um, sort of trying to get insight from kids. Has anyone ever asked kids or girls what they liked about programs um, that they have participated in? So things they enjoyed most, what they might change as, is there something they'd like to do again, just to actually get some of that insight from the kids. Um, and this sort of came when you were talking about having female coaches. And uh, that's something that I did with little kids. Um, when I was coaching um, full time and just wondering if anybody had had done that before at the club level. So I'll, I'll start by answering that on behalf of, uh, I guess, Orienteering Ottawa a little bit. We, we have in the past done some surveys. They've kind of gone through the parents and we've asked the parents to, to, uh, to kind of ask their kids for input on, on answering that. We never really got a lot of feedback. We did a kind of an online survey afterwards. Um, and then of course, now we are doing, um, we've been doing some work with Dalmi's help uh, on on this specific topic of, of girls. And uh, Domi, you talked to a number of parents. Uh, did you ever talk to any uh, any kids directly in this work? Um, there were a few, um, I think one kid came up um, when her parents were talking and the parents asked the questions, but like she wasn't really interested in articulating an answer. <laughs> I mean, fair enough, like I'm a stranger and that's fair. So um, I think if the coaches themselves were to ask that at the end of each like week or like every three weeks or so, it would certainly help um, particularly like the people who make the lessons and things like that to understand what the kids feel, like get the kids reaction, I guess. But um, yeah, I didn't really have a solid answer from the one kid that I spoke to. Yeah, fair enough. Tracy, I think you were saying that, that you were asking this as a coach, you asked this of your, of your kids rather than as a program administrator. So you, you were asking them of this directly when you were coaching them? Yeah, and I'd encourage my other coaches to do the same, even if it's just during cool down in the last 10 minutes, you know, just sort of, um, just asking like, what did you like about this practice? Or what did you like about the program? Or um, is there anything you'd want to do again? Is there anything we shouldn't do again? And sometimes what I got back was just, it was pretty interesting and insightful from kids. So um, that was just uh, what prompted me to ask. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic idea. I, I um, certainly it's a takeaway that I'll be uh, taking to Orienteering Ottawa um, to, to let coaches know that they should be asking those questions and then obviously yeah. they need to provide that back to our program administrators. I think I, I did ask this a bit to the kids when I was coaching in the Yukon. I was coaching six to nine year olds and they liked the games, but I didn't ask specifically, like I didn't necessarily think specifically what did the girls say they liked and what did the boys say they liked, but I did get, they liked the games at the beginning, even when they were just like a warm up game of tag to just get them warmed up. Um, I think 
they found some of the map things challenging, which I kind of used to adapt the program a bit, but that was kind of the feedback that I'd gotten from them. But it it's hard to say how that, like I didn't specifically ask about gender, ask questions about gender and stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have time for one more question. Um, and there was a great question from Nevin about um, retention uh, at the high performance level with our national team. Uh, Nevin, do you want to do you want to ask that question uh, to the panel? Uh, thank you for asking me. Just as I take a bite of lasagna, Jeff. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. Excellent timing. Um, and hi everyone. This is a really great. Um, uh, great event. Um, shout out. Uh, I was one of those boys trying to keep up with Sherry uh, back in the day um, and still are trying to do that during Masters. Um, and as I put in the comment, uh, shout out to Pam, who uh, as a kid growing up orienteering the 80s, she was just one of the absolute rock stars of the sport um, out there. Uh, so I guess question to, and actually one last, <laughs> uh, Marg Ellis and Ann Toich, um, two of the, the strongest, um, well, I, I should be careful, I'll end up naming everyone, uh, two of the strongest officials uh, Canada has seen in the history of Orange in Canada uh, as really excellent female role models. Um, I guess in terms of looking at uh, retention of not just the jaywalk, athletes but also like top club runners um i think historically we say every year oh wouldn't it be strong wouldn't it be better if the f21 field was deeper um and that just kind of everyone just kind of shrugs and says oh too bad it's another it's a, another small f21 field um and then you know we'll have graduating classes from from national from hbc junior teams um, or kind of other club programs, are there any specific outreach to, um, um, you know, ha has, has either the Orientation Canada or have clubs actually looked at it and said, hey, uh, traditionally we lose these athletes at this age. What are we going to do to try to keep them? Um, has anything like that been tried? As far as I know, Nevin, uh, the answer to that is, uh, is mostly no, um, but I'm sure there are others on the call here that have a longer history uh, with our interior in Canada and with clubs than, than I do. So if anyone knows, knows otherwise, um, it would be great to, to hear from you. Um, I will say though that Emma Sherwood has been uh, looking at some data on, on exactly that topic. So Emma, do you have any comments? Yeah, so I was looking at only the people who actually joined the um, HPP team, as it has been called the HPP team for the past, I think it's since 2011. Anyways, um, so we actually, interestingly, though there are a lot, there are fewer women than men um, by a fair bit, um, the women and men have about the same t number of years that they've spent on the team, as in they both both women, women have spent about 4.0 years on average on the team and men have spent about 3.9 years on average. Um, of course, these are just like rough um, summaries um, based, and I haven't taken into account the fact that like there are women and men who are still currently on the team. Um, I didn't do anything with that, but like it is similar. There is more of a difference between senior and junior, but again, I think the sample sizes are kind of a bit small because it's, um, you know, it's, it's 76 athletes um, who have been on the HPP team or TCP as it is currently known. Um, but it's about, you know, two years on each for both men and women um, on average for on the senior team and the junior team. So there's actually not as much disparity in retention on the high performance team as you might expect. So then I think the question is um, recruitment onto the high performance team. Um, may is maybe where we're missing or even earlier along the ch chain um, moving up to uh, that sort of level prior to the, getting onto the team. Um, I think that that last point is, is super important. Um, I'm sure many of you were at the North Americans 
um, in 2018. Um, in Canada, we were putting together our VLA teams, um, junior and senior, women and men team. Um, and all of these girls were coming for the junior team that I had never met before um, and did phenomenally well. And I didn't even know, I mean, they don't live where I live, but I didn't know that they were there and they showed up and did a phenomenal job. So I think that it does come, it's a fine line between retention and recruitment because we got to keep the cycle going somewhere. And I think that programs, um, junior programs that are kind of advancing um, towards kind of that transition area um, can with, at a club level help reduce that discrepancy, the bridge the gap between a program and making the national team. And I think that with the Team Canada program this year, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the involvement of clubs to kind of help us um, tell us, like, hey, there's a really good athlete that I think that would really do a good job. Um, but it goes so much beyond me being asked to go to a, a walk when I was 16 and afraid of it, like everything. Um, and just as like a second thought, um, maybe if I had been asked to be like, hey, we really think that you have the potential. We're not just trying to fill a spot. Um, but those kind of things kind of increase the confidence saying we really want you um, goes really far. So I know that um, Sogo, with the help of uh, Jan Eric, is actually did implement a program for one year um, called the Bridge Program to bridge the gap between the younger junior programs and the um, national team, which might help. Though it might, I'm wondering if there could be something more helpful if there was a woman role model on there too, um, as I know that that was mostly boys and uh, one or two girls. Right. All right. Um, thank you uh, for those answers. I hope, Nevin, that that uh, gives you the answers you were looking for. And uh, that takes us to the end of our conversation. Um, thank you all for joining in. Thank you for some really good questions um, and uh, some various good comments in the chat as well and some links to, to a couple of resources. Um, I hope that there is uh, some good takeaways that can be uh, brought back to clubs all the way all across the country. Uh, we will be uh, making this available as a recording on YouTube um, and we'll be sharing that via Orienteering Canada's social media. So on behalf of uh, Orienteering Canada and Orienteering Ottawa, um, who have jointly put this together, thank you to uh, all of our panelists, Delmi, Emma, Emma, Sherry, um, for taking the time to participate in this. Um, really interesting conversation, um, some great tips, some great insight um, on, uh, on the topic of women and girls in orienteering. So thank you all and uh, have a good evening. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Great job, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.